When athletes are looking to be faster, to become more powerful or have better rates of force development overall, they often look to use the Olympic lifts or derivatives of them to train these traits. This has created a kind of rift in the strength and conditioning community between the group of coaches who think you should teach athletes the Olympic lifting movements and a group of coaches who think there are other movements that develop these traits just as effectively. Today we're going to look at a scientific paper which investigates the use of weightlifting derivatives and of normal resistance training exercises to see which develops those traits better. The title of today's paper is Comparison of the Hang High Pull and Loaded Jump Squat for the Development of Vertical Jump and Isometric Force Time Characteristics. So what we had was the University of uh, Calgary and the Department of Human Performance and Physical Education, Adam State University, Colorado, USA, did a collaboration. They had a couple of swimmers and basically their concern was for the swimmers, their ability to push off the wall was closely related to their ability to, you know, for example, vertical jump, being on the horizontal plane, very related skill. So they wanted to investigate for the most effective way of improving the swimmer's vertical jump. Now we know that the Olympic lifts can improve your vertical jump performance and other uh, rate of force development characteristics, but also jump squats, for example, can do that, but no one has ever compared. So their investigation was to compare the hang high pull versus the trap bar jump squat. So what they had was 18 swimmers. Uh, all of these were in preparation phase and they had at least one year strength training. These were collegiate level swimmers. So what was measured pre and post intervention was jump height, peak power, isometric peak performance, which was measured using a isometric mid tie pull, and finally the rate of force development. So what they had was 18 swimmers. They had a 10 week linear progression program. So high volume to start, slowly peaking in at the end to lower reps and higher intensity or slightly higher intensity. So the average intensity used for the hang high pull was approximately 70% of their 1RM power clean. For the trap bar deadlift, they used approximately 20% of their 1RM. So for the weighted jump squat, they used a trap bar deadlift and they used approximately 20% on average of their 1RM trap bar deadlift. It was a matched pairs randomized design study. So we had our swimmers split into two groups, randomly assigned to each of the groups basically. And they had the either the hang high pull or the trap bar weighted jump squat. For the results section, first we should look at kind of squat jump and counter movement jump height uh, and see their performance and the improvement in these across the 10 weeks. What's interesting is both groups improve in squat jump and counter movement jump as you would expect after the 10 week training interventions, but there's no significant difference between the improvements in the weighted jump group and the clean pull group. The other improvement was in peak power during the squat jump. A significant increase was noted in squat jump peak power across both groups again and echoing the same sentiments as the last one, no difference between the two training interventions. Isometric force time characteristics is the next one. So what we saw is significant increases across all of the five time bands in both the weightlifting derivative group and the weighted squat jump group. So what we see overall with the results is that the training interventions worked so in both the weighted jump group and the weightlifting derivative group, we saw increases across the main variables they were measuring, but no significant differences between the two groups. In terms of practical application and the kind of discussion of this paper, it does kind of clear up a few of the questions we may have, right? So the questions that always come up around coaching the Olympic lifts or their derivatives are athletes don't have time to do it. Athletes don't have the coaching resources to do it. And also there mightn't be the actual drive to do it. So if they're trying to learn their skill or they're trying to make significant changes in their physiology to make them better at their sport, the last thing they want to be doing is figuring out how to do a power clean or a snatch pull or something. The easiest option and the kind of ideal option here before we even go into the paper would be that like a weighted jump makes them just as good as weightlifting movements, you know, because for the strength and conditioning staff or coaching staff anywhere, it just, it's a lot easier to just get somebody onto a hex bar like they used here or get somebody wearing a weighted vest and get them to do their jumps with that. And that's basically what this paper has shown. Granted, the the group was pretty small that they used. It was only over 10 weeks rather than over the course of a four, five, six year cycle. Uh, there are obvious advantages to the weightlifting movements over long term uh, because you get the sense of mastery, you get the sense of variance with your training. 
So rather than treating an athlete like somebody who's super lazy and only worries about efficiency, you get somebody who can concentrate on a movement, learn that skill concurrently with their own sport, and they might get a sense of enjoyment or kind of sense of mastery over that skill over the course of a long career. You don't tend to get that with kind of weighted jump movements, even though they are much more efficient to coach. If you're coaching in a team environment or in an environment where you've limited equipment, they're obviously a lot easier to get players across the line. I think people would assume that we would be heavily for the Olympic lifts in, in this. So we know that Olympic lifts do improve your rate of force developments and other skills. But what's very, very useful about this is it just shows that they don't improve it more than much simpler, much lower, uh, less or more shallow learning curve movements. So like the trap bar, jump squat. Is so simple. It literally could not be easier. You hold the trap bar and you jump. That's literally all you need. Now, someone might have the argument from this to say that, well, they didn't do the full lift, so they didn't do them from the floor or they didn't have any of the catch variation. But realistically, those two portions of the lift and the very reason they didn't do those is because they are the least useful or at least transferable for like rate of force development. So the catch portion, for example, would have no benefits in terms of, um, you know, counter movement jump or the, you know, rate of force development or isometric pull static positions or anything like that like they they are not useful for that position so really break it down to the position that produces the most force makes the most sense it's the easiest to teach them uh, like they mentioned in the paper their view on this was is there a way of getting the benefits from the olympic lifts and is there a way of you know is it comparing it to other movements and so in our opinion and it's always been like even prior to this paper paper that unless you have someone who is very very talented you have a very very good coach to teach you the olympic lifts it's just not worth your time doing the Olympic lifts for a sport. Now, we're not saying, and we never say, that the Olympic lifts don't transport over the sport. They absolutely do, and that's without a doubt. But is it worth your time? And I know Fitz mentioned there, for example, there is great benefits to doing the lifts. But realistically, in most scenarios, like, for example, the real athletes Fitz would be coaching, they don't really do the Olympic lifts. Uh, Even if you had a full team, full-time athletes, Olympic level, full-time professionals, you probably wouldn't even teach them Olympic lifts. You might teach them some variants depending on how talented they are. But for something like this, it's a lot easier just to pick up a trap bar deadlift. They can learn it within 15 minutes. You could learn a very yeah. efficient trap bar deadlift. Uh, you don't also have the pretty high risk of injury. Now, high risk not in terms of the Olympic lifts are risking themselves, but high risk given the potential negatives of an athlete got injured when it's not their main sport. I mean, how would you bring it to a team manager that your athletes... Uh, sprain their wrists or you know mildly not even like even mildly hurt their knee doing something in the gym it is absolutely, almost yeah. indefensible and absolutely um you know it's very hard to defend that to those managers in for example like it is on paper not a great idea considering the risk to the athlete again like we mentioned the wrists are pretty low one of the weird quirks in though weight weightlifting for example would be doing something like full cleans or full snatches if you have for example field sport athletes something like that you actually it is a good way of teaching them to react to injuries like basketball players, something like that, or football, is it gives them a lot more of their tendons, for example, and their ability to kind of react to adverse situations better. So that's probably the main benefit I think Olympic lifts get that other movements don't give them. So your ability to protect yourself in adverse environments where there's high impact or high force in your tendons or ligaments. So, you know, going to the bottom of, um, you know, uh, you're, you're defending a basketball or someone hits you in rugby or American football, and takes you to the ground. It gives you a better ability to protect yourself uh, without conscious thought, you know, like a, a dynamic kind of internal process. Yeah. But I think, you know, you could probably get similar benefits from doing something like a full squat or a front squat or something like that, or maybe even a back squat. Like it would give your tendons the ability to react to situations like that. But that that kind of reaction stuff as well, like being, we use the term physical literacy a lot, mm-hmm. or we you'd have heard us talking about it in terms of athletic development. There's, positives you get like the reactions Gurf is talking about and your like your ability to recruit motor vi- or motor units very quickly comes on a lot more when you do higher skilled movements so if you have an athlete who's in like a developmental stage like you were saying earlier or they're a young athlete they're not able to lift much weight so they're not gonna be able to load up a, a weighted jump they're not gonna be able to similarly load up a power clean or something like that but you can get them to become very, very skilled at these complex movements. I think there is some value in that. Uh, a further kind of rebuttal on Gurf's point uh, to back him up would be people talk about like, oh, this isn't the full lifts. Professional athletes or even high level competitive athletes don't do the full lifts. 
like I can't think of any unless the player themselves are very, very personally driven or there might be a player group within a team that works with a certain coach. They're never doing a full clean and jerk. And almost further on again for that, they're never doing full snatches. I can't think of any athlete in a high-level team sport that would be doing that. They're always doing a derivative. So I think a lot of the time when we hear weightlifters and weightlifting coaches talking about the use of a split jerk or the use of a snatch and, and its transferability, it, it simply doesn't happen in the real world. Like if you if you break down an athlete's career into certain stages, so if you take, for example, the initial junior development stage, they're probably doing very, very... Or they're doing a lot of other sports. They're doing other, you know, aspects uh, as they should be, and it's one of the good reasons they will end up not being injured later in the career if they're doing multiple different sports. As they move through, they'll probably end up selecting their sports. So let's say they pick swimming, for example, in this scenario. So they're probably swimming would spend most days, six, seven days a week, at least four or five hours in the pool, which is a huge amount of volume, and it will get progressively heavier. So in this stage of their sport career, they're doing an awful lot of volume. They're still probably learning to perfect their skill of swimming, and almost certainly taking a lot of their time and energy so at this stage as well in their career they're developing strength conditioning in the gym so they if they have a system where they are pushed through strength conditioning in the gym very likely they're learning basic movements like squat benching deadlifting you know unilateral movements at this stage it doesn't make sense to introduce something complex like the snatch or the full clean for example it's too dynamic there's too much effort into a lot of skill realistically most of the coaches don't know how to coach it so then you're going to bring in a full-time coach or full-time weightlifting coach just to teach them in their limited hours in the gym. So if, say, for example, you bring it back to the preparation period, which, for example, these sprinters were in, or these swimmers were in in this study, you've got maybe three months, four months. I'm not even sure. I don't imagine it lasts too long in swimming. You've got a very, very short window to teach people. I know when we think about it, it takes weightlifters 10 years to perfect the movement. So how long over a number of years would they need to get proficient at the lift when they have only a couple of months a year doing that? Then if we move on to, you know, their main period of the career, so their peak athletic development, realistically, they're doing a lot of competitions. They've probably found the movements that work very well for them. So it doesn't make sense to introduce this at this stage of their career because they're their peak competition demands. They're really, really focused on not injuring themselves, which could definitely happen on heavy snatch clean jerks because, you know, for example, maybe you have less than 10 years as your peak athletic career. You know, you get injured for one or two seasons. That could be... One season gone from injury, then you could be left at one season building back up. So then you've wasted maybe, you know, up, you could waste up to 20, 20% of your athletic career. And then obviously in your latter stages, you're not going to introduce new movements like this. Whereas trap bar deadlift, 50 min, 15, 20 minutes, you learn a very, very efficient movement. You get the same benefits. And I think you get the other benefits from the Olympic lifts that you probably, you can get from other movements that don't necessarily have to be the Olympic lifts. Yeah. So I'd say realistically, it comes down to one in a million scenario where you've got a very very good athlete you've got great equipment you've got a even more important than the athlete being very good because a lot of people can learn the olympic lifts given yeah thousands of hours hundreds of hours minimum you need someone who's incredibly proficient and very very skilled at teaching the olympic lifts to people and uh, i just don't see that out there and i don't see it being a practical way of people doing that so realistically you'd need someone um for us like example who've gone yeah. come from weightlifting into a broader spectrum but realistically, how often will that happen where someone has spent 10, 15 years learning the Olympic lifts, but also then end up in a scenario where you're coaching collegiate level athletes um, in a strength and conditioning gym? I think it's so few and far between. Yeah. I, I think it's a very unlikely scenario. So the way to see movements do make you better at uh, moving more proficiently, rate of force development, speed, uh, potentially injury protection. But there's almost certainly better movements that you can learn that are simpler, uh, more efficient and safer than the Olympic lifts. So if you're an actual athlete and you want coaching, whether that be one-to-one -one or if you want off-season blocks for strength and hypertrophy work, you can get in contact with us. Just go to www.seekstrength.com and you can look at the programs there. If you're looking for more content from us, don't forget to check out the Seek Strength podcast. It's on Spotify, SoundCloud and iTunes. Uh, so a lot more content from us. There's, If you've never found it before, there's over 70 episodes at the moment on a whole host of subjects. So go check that out.